Hi, Oz Hillman here, and thanks for joining me for this special teaching on a man and his work. You know, years ago, I discovered that God really wants to be part of our life from Monday to Friday, not just on Sunday. Uh, I was like many people who often lived on Monday as if I was a Monday morning atheist, you know, not understanding that God wanted to be part of my working life as well. So in this session, I'm going to help you understand what the Bible says about our working life and how you can experience God in your work life. So let's join the teaching. Men at Work, a vision for transforming men, their families, workplaces, cities, and nations for Christ. Before we get started today, I want to ask you a question. Where do the majority of men spend the majority of their time interacting with the majority of the lost world? Is it at church? Is it in the neighborhood? There's only one place, the workplace. So today we want to talk about some challenges that men face as it related to their work. But let's first ask, where do most men gain most of their self-esteem needs? Uh, is it in the workplace? Yes. That's exactly where it is. Where is the central nervous system of a man's heart besides sex? <laughs> well, it's his value as a man is often derived by his success or failure in his work. What type of problems are discussed more than 50% of the time in small groups, according to a Gallup survey? Workplace-related issues. What one area do men have a 50 to 80% dissatisfaction rate in their life? It's their work life. You see, the Wall Street Journal survey revealed a 50% dissatisfaction rate among executives and 80% dissatisfaction rate among general workplace population. 500 surveys among Christians revealed a 50% dissatisfaction. I, uh, I don't like my job, and uh, I don't think I'm going to go anymore. You're just not going to go? Yeah. Won't you get fired? I don't know. But I really don't like it, and uh, I'm not going to go. <laughs> so you're going to quit? Nuh-uh. Not really. Uh, I'm just going to stop going. <laughs> uh, when did you decide all of that? About an hour ago. Oh, really? Yeah. About an hour ago. <laughs> so are you going to get another job? I don't think I'd like another job. <laughs> what are you gonna do about money and bills and... You know, I've never really liked paying bills. I don't think I'm gonna do that either. <laughs> uh, well, so what do you wanna do? I wanna take you out to dinner. Well, I doubt that he'll have success with that based on what he just said. What causes more stress on a man than any other area which often gets brought home to his family? Again workplace related issues what percentage of men have been intentionally taught to apply biblical faith to their work life through their local church sadly only three to ten percent 84 percent of christian 18 to 29 year olds admit that they have no idea how the bible applies to their field or professional interest according to a barna research study in 2012 Men were created to conquer. What area are they most required to conquer in their lives? Their work lives. Today I want to share with you that your work matters to God. And we want to look at the scriptures and understand what the Bible really says about our work. Let's begin by watching this brief video that really tells a great story biblically. Work. Most of us spend over half our lives at work. Whatever it is you fill the 9 to 5 with, planting crops, building cars, taking care of patients, teaching students, or running a business, work is where most of life happens. For some, work is a drain. They dread Monday mornings, forcing themselves to struggle through because they need the paycheck, while many times feeling trapped and beaten down by their job. Some people love their work. They're good at what they do. It energizes them. It's a place of security, a place to chase dreams, desires, and success. At work, they find fulfillment. We often forget to connect our faith to our work. 
We don't consider the reasons God may have us at our job. We don't think about the purpose and meaning we could bring to our work. We simply focus on how it makes us feel. But what if we saw our work as an opportunity to worship? As Christians, we are called to serve Christ with our lives. For a few, that means working as a pastor, a youth minister, or a missionary. Others serve the church by teaching children or singing in the choir. But when Sunday is over, most of us return to our jobs outside the church. For us, our mission is in the marketplace. We may not be the kind of missionary who moves to the far regions of Africa, but around the conference table, around the water cooler, around the cubicle, we have an opportunity to worship the God who created us. He gave us skill. He gave us passion. He gave us work. When we do our jobs with excellence and integrity and diligence, it's an act of worship. We are displaying God's craftsmanship to the non-believing world around us. We are earning the right to be heard. We don't see a divide between Sunday and Monday, between the sacred and the secular. We've been invited into parts of the world that a pastor or a traditional missionary will never see. We have conversations with people who would never set foot in a church. Whether we love or dread our work, we choose to turn the focus away from ourselves and toward the mission God has for us. Church is not the only place we worship, and Sundays are not the only days in our calendars that have meaning. Every day on Mission for God brings us great joy. Like the heroes before us, we can be modern-day Noahs and Josephs and Peters who are called with a purpose. God has designed us. He created us to work and to worship. For us, work is worship. What an awesome video that really lays the foundation for helping us understand that our work is to be worship. There are some key issues and barriers that keep us from doing that. The concept of sacred-secular, equality and calling, defining what ministry really is, and understanding the local church as an equipper. Os Guinness wrote a book called The Call, and in that book he talks about something called the Catholic distortion. It's when we first introduced in 300 AD the concept that one thing is sacred and another is secular. And then, in 1200 A.D., something called the Protestant distortion came along that said work equals vocation versus a calling. In other words, it's just a place to collect a check. The net result of these two uh, false beliefs is that we, in the workplace, often feel like we are second-class citizens, that work is less spiritual, that money is evil, until there's a building program, and then it's very spiritual. You see, I often tell this story about two men who get lost on an island. One of these men is very wealthy, and he tells the other man, I'm not worried, we're going to get off this island. And the other one says, well, I don't know why you think that. He says, it's because I uh, make $100,000 a week. He says, well, that does you no good here. Oh, but I make $100,000 a week, and I give 10% of that to my local church. I'm confident my pastor is going to find me. <laughs> and so often that's the case, isn't it? That we often feel like we're there just to write a check. Well, where is God moving today and why? It's the workplace. The workplace is where God is moving in uh, leadership more than any other area today. Dr. Billy Graham once said, I believe that one of the next great moves of God is going to be through the believers in the workplace. God has begun an evangelism movement in the workplace that has the potential to transform our society as we know it, said Franklin Graham. Henry Blankaby says, God is marshalling his people in the workplace as never before in history. Bill Pollard, former chairman of Service Master, said, In today's global community, the greatest cha channel of distribution for salt and light is the business community, the marketplace. Workplace ministry will be one of the core future innovations in church ministry. Indeed, as with first century Christianity, it all begins in the marketplace where the disciples of Jesus daily rub shoulders with the lost. Let's look at the concept of work and the various attributes of it. You see, work itself is ministry because God gave each of us a unique DNA to meet human needs. The word ministry equates to service. It comes from the word diakonia. 
That means that whenever you're serving someone, no matter if it's in a secular way or not, if you're doing it to glorify God, then it's ministry. Then work is worship, just as we saw. And these words, work and worship, come from a word called avodah. It's a Hebrew word. Work to minister is another way that God uses our work. It's a platform by which we can share Christ with others. It's a place to earn money and create wealth in order to establish God's kingdom, as it says in Deuteronomy 8.18. It's a place to care for the poor. Leviticus 19 gives us the story of Boaz, who leaves some of the gleanings in his field behind for the poor. And then it's a platform for influence and societal transformation. You see, Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. You see, in our society, we've often had this unspoken hierarchy of spiritual calling. It goes like this. The pastor is the most spiritual calling, and then the missionary, and then the church worker then the stay-at-home mom and the plumber, and then the CEO executive. And then way down the list is the scum of the earth, the ad agency executive. Well, maybe it's the lawyer, you see. uh, But the truth is, none of that's true, you see, based on Colossians 3.23. You see, Jesus and Paul modeled work-life ministry. Of 132 public appearances in the New Testament, 122 of those were in the marketplace. Of 52 parables Jesus told, 45 had a workplace context. And of 40 miracles in the book of Acts, 39 were in the marketplace. Someone recently said that the first Reformation took the word of God to the common man and woman. The second Reformation is taking the work of God to the common man and woman. That time is now. The greatest potential ministry in the world today is the marketplace. Christ's greatest labor force is those men and women already in that environment. What do we mean when we say workplace ministry? Well, workplace ministry is an intentional focus of equipping men and women in all spheres of work and society to understand and experience their work and life as a holy calling from God. That's what our ministry does, is help men and women understand that. How can men's ministry impact more men to transform their workplaces and families and nations? Well, by equipping men to live successfully in the place where they spend 60 to 70% of their waking hours. Let me ask you another question. Could it be the church on Monday through Friday is actually more important than the church on Sunday? You see, Jesus modeled that, didn't he? He recruited 12 from the workplace. His activity was in the marketplace, in in the uh, the businesses, in the the, uh, city streets. He um, uh, never took anybody into the synagogue to get healed. His evangelism was in the marketplace, and that's what we should be about as well. Relating to a man through his work is often the entry door to his heart. You see, so many in, the, uh, in our history have ushered into their calling through a crisis. The entry door to their larger story of our lives is often through a crisis. That's what happened to Paul and Luther and Joseph, Esther, and even David. Martin Luther King, all of these had some type of crisis event that ushered them into their larger story. That happened to me in 1994. I had a crisis of uh, great magnitude where I lost over half a million dollars, 80% of my business, my wife left me, and uh, a vice president took my second largest account. I had a successful ad agency for 12 years, but then the crisis happened. And so God would take me through a season of seven years of adversity. It would be in that season that he would transform my life and move me into a whole new calling. You see, God allows a leader's heart to be broken to allow him the capacity to identify and empathize with those he's called to serve. And God used my adversity to birth a ministry to men and women in the marketplace. Little would I know he would take my valley of Acor and turn uh, into a door of hope and take me to 26 countries and speak at Promise Keepers three times. 
I would end up starting to write books, and I would write 21 books, and God would use me in ways I never thought possible. You see, God turns our valley of Achor. My calling is to help people understand that their work life has spiritual value and to shepherd Joseph's through their pit experience to become cultural change agents. Maybe that's where you are. You see, the depth and width of the adversity is often proportional to our influence. And whatever God sets you free from, he automatically gives you an anointing to set other people free from the very thing you were a victim of. It's a fact that if Christ is not Lord of my work, he will never be Lord of my family. I see that over and over again. If you've not been able to connect your faith life to your work life, it's doubtful you're doing it at home. So, what are the implications? Where is the authority that has the greatest potential to transform cities and societies? It's the marketplace. We're in a critical time in our nation. Only a revival of hearts will change our culture. Will you be a catalyst for that to happen? In 1857, there was a man who was in a local church. He was in downtown New York City, a block from the um, World Trade Center. And the result of uh, a commission from his church to go start a prayer meeting resulted in one of the great revivals in our nation. Over two million conversions happened as a result of a prayer meeting that started with just six people but after three months was uh, had 30,000 meeting for prayer in New York City. It could happen again today. I encourage you today to commit your work to God, to make Jesus Lord of your work, and to allow God to manifest His presence in your daily work life. Be a problem solver at work like Jesus was a problem solver. The net result is you'll have influence. So what could happen when we do this? Transformation will take place in lives, workplaces, families, cities, and even nations. Let me tell you a wonderful story about George Washington Carver. He was an inventor, and he worked in the agricultural area. He was a Christian. He was led to Christ by his mother, who was sold into slavery. He told the farmers that they had to stop planting cotton and needed to plant peanuts and sweet potatoes instead. The farmers respected him and followed his advice. Unfortunately, uh, there was not demand for peanuts or sweet potatoes. It led him into a crisis, and he asked God the question, Why did you make the peanut, God? And God gave him 300 marketable products from the peanut and 100 from the sweet potato. Let's continue the conversation. I want to give you two gifts that will help you in your journey today. The first is my free devotional, Today God is First. It's currently read in 105 countries. It will help you integrate your faith life into your work life and help you to reconcile adversity in your life. Just go to todaygodisfirst.com and you'll find four devotionals there. You can sign up one or all four. Secondly, uh, I just remind you that TGI has been around a while. And, you know, I got an email from Adam, a hedge fund CEO in Zurich, Switzerland, who told me that we've been using TGI in our small groups for four years. And so you never know how God's going to use your adversity. A second resource for you is something called Are You a Biblical Worker? It's a 50 true false self assessment about how you would operate your faith in the workplace. At the end of the book are the answers and the scriptures. I think both of these resources will help you in your journey. Just go to freebiblicalworker.com and enter your email to receive that download. So, in closing, I want to pray for you that God will use you to fulfill his purpose in and through you and to cause revival in our nation through your work life. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to hear principles and scriptures on your work life and how it applies to us. And so we ask for your grace and your power and your influence now. In Jesus' name, amen.